ओम सदाशिव सरंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यम अस्मदाचार्यपर्यता वंदे गुरुपरंपरा सो लास्ट टाइम वी सो इन टॉकिंग अबाउट के वेरी इनडायरेक्टली टेलिंग डीलिंग विद द टॉपिक ऑफ हु एम आई एक्चुअली बिकॉज ही सेट कौमारम यौवनम झरा देहे नस्मिन यथा देहे कौमारम यवनम जरा लाइक इन दिस बॉडी यू गो थ्रू दीज वेरियस एक्सपीरियंसेस ऑफ यूथ ओल्ड एज यू नो चाइल्डहुड यूथ ओल्ड एज एंड देन देहांतर प्राप्ति ही नाउ ही पुट्स इट वेरी ब्रीफली फॉर अर्जुना बिकॉज रोम बर अर्जुना इज अ वज्रमुष्टि वॉरियर सो लॉट ऑफ दीज आइडियाज आर कॉमन at higher level of traditional martial arts okay a lot of these ideas are common there also but to specify it brings us to the question of really speaking what the i is about okay what the i is about and that is where the whole question comes because remember he had said deluded by who am i i'm asking you the question <laughs> what will take me to moksha shreyas and we also saw that the whole thing is based on self ignorance all that we had seen up to now so a certain amount of this is necessary understanding is necessary here some of you have been, may have been exposed to it some of you may not have been for those who are exposed it's a revision for those not exposed it's understanding okay <laughs> so when he is saying like childhood youth old age tatha dehantara prapti similarly another lifetime uh, life another life obviously he is talking about an atma and i which is dehaadi vyatirakta different from the body etc so the question will be in terms of what exactly is that i or is there an i like that can you even start with that is there an i or does the sense of i begin with birth and end with death if you look at the purely biological or the scientific model they'll always say life begins with birth ends with death this is the scientific model yeah. because the scientific model is a very materialistic model materialistic model meaning that everything evolves from material what do you call life consciousness etc it's all an evolute of matter but then you you forget another principle in science itself that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed it can only have a change of form therefore if there is life now you can only have a change of form you cannot destroy it even when you are destroying the body what are you doing you are converting it into another matter let us say the birth, the person dies a natural death if you are a christian or a muslim or something you will bury the body it will become food for the worms so they eat your body and they grow etc so for your body material is converted into another body 
if you are a sadhu or a sailor the sailor burial at sea you become food for the fishes as a sadhu your body is put into the ganga you become food for the fishes again <laughs> and so we are hindus we burn the body you burn the body and then you put the water in the river and the river puts it onto the shore and you become pumpkin for your grandchildren <laughs> so even the body is only undergoing changes and modification and things like that so then the question and but he makes it a very specific point here when he says kaumaram yavanam jara three states he gives you yeah childhood youth old age the sense of i is constant that's why aging is very very relative your body of course grows old what you could do at 25 you can't do now <laughs> agreed <laughs> agreed but mentally unless you are feeling too tired and unenthusiastic you don't really age there is no old mind there is a mind that is tired a mind that has lost its enthusiasm you know as we say mar khar ke ma kha ke i mean we got to get, get a lot of kicks in life you have lost enthusiasm that can be there but in what way does the mind age or you have gone through so much of traumatic experiences you are not dealt with that you are not recovered with that therefore it becomes a dead weight on you but the, how does the mind per se age otherwise some you what about forgetfulness this that etc that is a brain aging <laughs> forgetfulness etc is not connected with your mind in fact your subconscious mind has got all the memories all i have to do is access it <coughs> things which your conscious mind has forgotten is there in the subconscious <laughs> past life memories karma etc in your unconscious <laughs> a bit more difficult to access what it is there so that sense of i being constant that becomes the starting point for our inquiry into looking at who exactly is i because as i said lot of self judgments we have made and these self judgments we make on the basis of the roles that we play forget body even before identifying with the body the roles that i play with this body i am a mother figure you know i am mama why because i have kids and things like that so my identity comes from me being a mother so one identity or from my job and some job identities are difficult to drop like i am a doctor if you are a doctor that identity becomes very difficult to drop why because you only want to drop others who love you yeah you wanted to have a good time you went for a party okay you went for a party and there somebody asked you what do you do you said i am a doctor immediately he'll say sir i have a back ache can you give me some advice <laughs> you have come to the party to drop that role <laughs> you don't want to be interacting with patients etc but people will yeah. so certain roles become difficult to drop but these are all roles that you are playing it is a self judgment dependent on your job your profession your calling whatever 
not you. The roles are dependent on you. You are independent of the role. You picked up the role, you can drop that role. But our role identification is very strong. Because some roles you had with your birth itself. You are the child of these parents. And you may be a 50 year old Hulk, but your mama will still teach you like, treat you like a baby. My <laughs> mom, big excuse for everything. <laughs> All over the world this is there, okay? <laughs> In various forms. India may be a bit more. In traditional society is a little bit more. But it is a role. Yeah. By the incident of your birth to these parents, they become. Your older brother or older sister. Again, by birth, from birth, you have that role. It's a role. It's about you from the standpoint of someone else. And how do you say it's only a role? Let us say your parent is here, your child is here. You look this side, you become the child. You look this side, you become the parent. Just with one look. With one look, you're picking up a role and dropping a role. Just by looking this side, that's it. <laughs> what more you want to know that it is just a role? Okay, but all roles are played by this body and mind. Correct? That doesn't change. So let us see, are you really the body and mind? So the universal experience is that I am the body, isn't it? It's completely universal. The fact you are the body is a universal experience. Not only you, your pet dog also feels I am the body, no? I have a doggy body, I am, no? <laughs> So, this is universal. Why? Body is tall, I am tall. Body is short, I am short. Body is talking, I am talking. Body is walking, I am walking. So, you are walker, talker, walker, etc. Unless you are phantom, then you are kit walker for generations. <laughs> but, Okay. So how do you know you are tall, short, etc.? How do you make that evaluation? Yeah, because I am aware of this body. I know the body. Okay. Fair enough. Plus you have other experience. You will come and tell me. Samji, I, had a, I went to the gym yesterday. What a workout I had. Great workout. But my whole body is paining. My whole body is paining. One second, one second. I thought you said I body. Now you are saying my body? I and mine cannot be the same, can it? My phone, but not iPhone. Even if it is an iPhone, it is still my phone only. <laughs> it can't be iPhone. <laughs> iPhone, you know. It's mine. So, I and mine have to be two separate things. Correct? So, if it is I body, it cannot be my body. If it is my body, it cannot be I body. But you have experienced both ways. Your language reveals your experience, isn't it? Sometimes I, sometimes mine. So, here is where the logic will come in. What I am aware of cannot be me. I have a subject-object relationship. This phone cannot be me. Why? Because I am aware of the phone. I have a subject-object relationship with it. Very clear. I am the subject. The phone is an object. Now, 
Are you aware of your body? How do you say you have a backache? Uh, my back, I have. Tell me, you go to the doctor and say you have a backache. And the doctor examines you. And says there is nothing wrong with you. But can he deny the fact that you have a backache? He can say there is nothing wrong with you, correct? And that's true, there is nothing wrong. Physically speaking, the spine etc. is alignment, muscles are okay, they are, they are relaxed, but they have their necessary tension in them. All that is the physical examination you can make out. But can he deny your backache? Why? Because you are aware of it intimately. If you say you have a backache, you have it. Then you'll have to say, maybe it's postural. Are you under some stress? <laughs> he'll ask you to ask those type of questions. <laughs> Why? Because you are aware of your body. All of us are also aware, your body is sitting there, I can see so many people. Do you have a subject-object relationship with this body? Yeah. Hey, Baba, put on some weight, Baba. I should knock off some weight. Subject-object, you're objectifying your body, isn't it? I'm five and a half feet tall. You objectified the body is in terms of height. Yeah. I'm feeling all aches and pains. You identified your body. You objectified your body. Therefore, you have a subject-object relationship with your body, you are aware of the body, it is not you. Ah, it's my body, okay, okay, I don't want, I don't want your body, I have one to take care of bad enough. <laughs> to keep this body in this condition, it takes a lot of effort, no? Proper diet, nutrition, rest, exercise, oh my God. Kya kya karna padta hai? To keep it functional. And as you grow older, you have to spend more time exercising and things like that, not less time. <laughs> so, more care. Correct, no? An old car requires more attention, no? A new car will function without problem. I say, yeah. Body is the same. <laughs> so, I'm aware of this body. I am not this body. Okay, fine. Then what? Then in between, you have a prana, your energy systems, your biological system. I am low energy today. I don't know what. Or today, I am enthusiastic, high energy. But you have a subject-object relationship with that also. Come, do all these pranayamas, your energy will come up well. You will be raring to go. <laughs> So you're manipulating your energies. If you're into advanced pranayamas, qigong, etc., you're manipulating your energies. You're aware of your energies. Not you. Then what is the next step? My mind, especially emotions. You know, emotions make the human being. Artificial intelligence is there, but not emotions. Huh? Don't worry, if artificial intelligence is there, artificial emotions are not far behind. <laughs> How many people are in love with their computer? Yeah, this is mine. Forget computer, I, your phone. This is mine, I can't <laughs> live without this. <laughs> Like the Bombay housewife telling me, husband is there or not, I can't live without my maid, I can't function without my maid. <laughs> you can function without a husband, not without my maid. <laughs> so similarly, emotions. You love something, you say, I'm an angry man. I'm a caring man. 
I'm very assertive. I'm loving. All this is what? Adjective based on your emotions. No? And are you aware of those emotions or not aware of it? Yeah. Where are you going wrong with this guy? Useless character. Good for nothing. But I love the guy. You are aware you love the guy? Hey, useless. What do you see in him? Whatever you say. I love the person. So you are sure you love the person? Yeah. How? My emotions, I am aware of it. Na? That means what? You have objectified your emotions. You have a subject-object relationship with your emotions. Your emotions are not you. Your emotions, but not you. And that's why they keep changing. Morning you felt something, evening you felt something else. Today it was, I love you. Tomorrow, it is, I allow you. You go your way, I go my way. <laughs> emotions are not, emotions are fickle. They don't, they are not constant. Not you. What is left? We have come a long way. We started with our roles, the body, our prana, our emotions. Now what? We are here. Intellectuals, thinkers. Yeah. What are you thinking right now? I'm thinking of what you said, etc. How do you know? Do you know what you're thinking? Yeah, very much so. Are you aware of your thinking? Yeah. Can you change your thinking? Yeah, of course. With better logic, etc., I can change the thinking. That means what? It's your thinking, your ideas, your knowledge. You're aware of the whole thing, not you. Not you. Even your knowledge you are not. Why? You were there to gather all that knowledge. No? You went to college, you got hold of a degree, this, that, you educated yourself. You were there before that knowledge. And you will be there when that knowledge becomes redundant also. <laughs> Lot of things we studied in school have become redundant. Yeah. Which means what? Not you. You have a subject-object relationship. <laughs> so if I'm not my knowledge, then what am I? Ignorance? Yeah, that ignorance must be me. Like in deep sleep. Blissful. Kya maja hai. But are you aware of your ignorance? How can I be aware of your ignorance? If you are not aware of your ignorance, how can you gather knowledge? Like if I ask a question here, how many of you here know Russian? Anyone here knows Russian? Okay, as conscious as one or two people from abroad, whether they would know or not. <laughs> no one knows Russian. Are you all, all aware of your ignorance of Russian? Yeah. So your ignorance you are aware of, you have a subject-object relationship. Which brings me to the question, Sir, I just want to know who you are. Please tell me who you are. <laughs> you are just a name. <laughs> Some of you I know. <laughs> Some of you I don't. <laughs> Some of you I have not met. Hopefully I'll meet over the year. So. You can say something very safely. I am the one who is aware of all this. May who I am, that is clear, no? Everyone knows I am. There is no doubt I am or I am not. Does anyone doubt, do I, am I really there? Knock, knock, am I there? <laughs> no. I am is self-evident. What I am we are discussing. We started with roles and came right up to the ignorance and the fact I am aware of anything. I am the one who is aware of everything.
but awareer you are with respect to an object of awareness with respect to an object of awareness you are the one who is awareer like walker talker awareer with respect to this body i am awareer i am aware of the body respect to this mind i am aware of the mind with respect to myself without that er just awareness okay then we still have to look into what is the nature of that awareness <laughs> if i am awareness if i am awareness by saying i am awareness your problem is not solved only you have dropped the problems of the roles and the body and things like that your problem of finitude limitations etc is not solved right now to say i am awareness is like saying i have a soul what's the difference in fact i have not one i have four souls two souls of my hand and two of my feet <laughs> four souls i am awareness for moksha you have to discover that this awareness is limitlessness okay you want me to touch upon that here right now or you want me to go to the verses and come back <laughs> okay right now i'll touch upon it okay yeah please touch upon okay i'll touch upon it right now elaborate it when the verses come now for this awareness me i know okay the one who is aware of everything that awareful being okay this i we have to see whether this i is limited or not right now it looks limited why there is one awareness pocket of awareness here there is another pocket of awareness you so many pockets of awareness all around correct right here in the class 40 po pockets of awareness <laughs> on screen off screen everything <laughs> is that true is a question now for awareness to be limited minimum there should be limitation in terms of time and space correct time space limitations makes it limited so now we have to see whether time and space limits awareness or not let us start with time here for those who are scientifically inclined okay it will be a good idea or has some science background to read stephen hawking's brief history of time it's a beautiful book unless you have good science background you will not be able to finish the book but about one and a half chapters you will be able to read even without too much of science background that's enough for our purpose <laughs> okay because what is the purpose to see time and space as one in the shastra we always looked upon time and space as one therefore when you discuss time you did not mention space when you discuss space you did not mention time because you cannot think of time without thinking of space it is 9:30 pm where australia <laughs> can you see it is 5:30 pm where india <laughs> can you see time and space go together then there now here <laughs> in your mind they're inevitably woven together so well, anyway let's start with time and see does time limit consciousness there are various ways of doing this i prefer to do it using a little bit scientific version how does science define time 
defined as a gap between two events. Okay, time is a gap between two events. Olden days, agrarian society. Two events was what? Sunrise, sunset. Was okay, na? I got two events. Sunrise and sunset. So from sunrise to sunset was day. And from sunset to sunrise was night. Okay, I come. Simple. Two events. But then even then we needed finer. It was too long. Too long a gap. We needed finer measurements. So we said, okay, sunrise. Noon when the sun is right overhead. Sunset. So we had the idea of three sandhyas. <laughs> You are supposed to do your Sandhya Vandana etc. three times a day. Yeah. Now, but even in an aggregate in society, you need finer measurements. You can't say, I'll meet you in the morning. Morning means what? Any time between sunrise to noon, too long a gap. So we started dividing this time further. In India, we had the concept of Yamam. Yamam was three hours. One Yamam was three hours. Okay. So the day was divided into four Yamams, 12 hours, <laughs> roughly. Then we had a Muhurta, which was roughly one hour. And we had a Nimisha, which is about a second. <laughs> So like that we had various measure of time. So in the western world also time was divided like that, 24 hours. See, we had a reason for going by Muhurta, etc. Okay? 24 is the number of Gayatri, that's why we went into that. <laughs> okay? Western world, why did you do it? divide the day into 24? You should have made, follow the decimal system, na. 20 hours. Day and night, and then divide one hour into 100, 100 minutes, 100 seconds, etc. Kar sakta tha, na? Decimal system, uh, calculation becomes so much difficult with that. <laughs> 24 hour system. Anyway, so what I am trying to say is what have you done? Gap between events, isn't it? So, as your measurement needed to be more and more finite, it became, I mean, more and more accurate, it became the pulses of a quartz. Most of you are wearing quartz watches, no? Now it has become, of course, electronic watches. No, whatever. They also have a quartz inside to measure that time. So two pulses of a quartz, the gap between that is a unit of time. Correct? We have come a long way from sunrise, sunset to the pulses of a quartz. Time has remained the same. Measurement has changed. The gap between two events. Followed up to here, no? very clear, very simple. Now, another scientific principle comes into the picture. There is no event without an observer. That's why that famous philosophical question. If a tree fell in the forest and nobody saw it fall, did it fall? <laughs> you can think about it later, okay? <laughs> no event without an observer. So, the two pulses, the sunrise, sunset becomes two observations. Two pulses of a quartz becomes two observations. Two observations means what? Two thoughts in the mind of a conscious being. So, what you call as time is nothing but a gap between two thoughts, two observations, two thoughts. And then we have a flow of observations. And in between the two thoughts, what is there? In between the two thoughts, what is there? Me, the conscious being, remember? Thoughts come in me, die down into me. I, the conscious being. So when you are looking at myself through this flow of thoughts, you get an illusion called time.
right or wrong? So, looking at myself through the flow of thoughts, I say, time. Now, is that I am the one who is observing the, my mind? All the thoughts are being observed by me. So, a product of thought, can it limit me, the consciousness? It can limit my body, of course it can. I age. But tell me, does all parts of your body age in the same manner? No, no. <laughs> I had my first streak of grey hair when I was 25, 26. Nowadays you see people in their 30s are having a lot of grey hair. <laughs> that is ageing. But the body is fit and strong. <laughs> body has not aged. Or one organ has aged. The other organs are okay. <laughs> this happens all the time. So, even there it is not uniform. In one body it is not uniform, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Forget all bodies being uniform. <laughs> so, this thing called time is nothing but the flow of thoughts. It cannot limit the I awareness that is aware of the whole thing. So, this awareness I is unlimited in terms of time. It is not conditioned by time at all. That means you awareness is neither born nor dying. That is something. No? Body is born and dying. Mind is not born and dying. Mind is changing all the time, that is true. You will change your mind faster than you change your clothes anyway. Even if you are a person like this, young girl whom I saw at a wedding, the sister is getting married. And the marriage went on the ceremony the whole day, we were all there together the whole day. And every two hours I'm seeing she's in a different dress. <laughs> every two hours. Forget for every function that I can understand. Mehndi one dress, this Sangeet one dress. No, no. Every two hours she is I said, hey, kya baat hai? <laughs> Even if you are like that, your mind changes faster than that. <laughs> But you, awareness, objectifying the changing mind, objectifying the changing body. Kaumaram yavanam jara, remember? Or the seven stages of man that Shakespeare talked about. Birth, childhood, young person, middle age, old person, death. Seven stages of, and the three stages of woman. Shakespeare, okay. What are the three stages? Baby, childhood, young woman, young woman, young woman, young woman, okay. <laughs> Typical MCP jokes, okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but the <clears throat> high consciousness is objectifying the whole thing, untouched by these things. Tata deha antara prapti. What has happened? Are yaar, this dress has become too old and faded. It started falling apart. Discard it, pick up a new one. Similarly, body is falling apart. Not really functional anymore. Discard it, pick up a new one. <laughs> Yeah. 
Dehantra Prapti. Another body you got. Same way. And along with the consciousness, your mind, etc., also goes into another body. What we call rebirth. Is there proof of rebirth? Scientific? Nope. It is not a subject matter for science, therefore, there is no scientific proof. It is dialectical. But there is supporting logic. People remembering their past births, this, that, etc., past lifetime, all recorded by science. So can you say, oh, that person remembered past life. Only for that time there was a past lifetime. Can you say that? That's illogical. <laughs> all of us have had lifetimes. Yeah. All of us have had lifetimes. And all of us can remember it. Yeah. All of us can. It's easy to access. It's not very difficult to access those memories. Yeah. It's not difficult at all. Some people, there is a bit more resistance, therefore, a little bit more difficult. Or some people, very easy. Yeah, to access your memory is fine. Yeah. So, there is supporting evidence for rebirth. There is no proving evidence, okay? The proof is the words of the Shastra. Supporting logic you have. If I dismiss time, I dismiss space as well. If time-bound limitations are not there, space-bound limitations are also not there. Again, we can quickly look into it. Okay. Like what? What is the truth of time, of space, time we saw? What is the truth of space? What is that unit of space that is indivisible? First, building block. Because here can mean when? Okay, let me look at a bit of time in the same manner, then it will be easier for you to understand. What is the truth of time now? Right? The past was present when you experienced it. The future will be present when you experience it. Therefore, now is the truth of time. Now means what? The present century? Present year? Present month? Present week? Present day? Present hour? Hour is 60 minutes? Present minute? What does now mean? Present second, nanoseconds. Which is the present? Now means what? Present, you awareness. So living in the present is but nothing but living in awareness, okay? A side light I want to mention because everything. Living in the now, living in the now. So to counteract that, I wrote an article, a small little article. It is available somewhere called The Tyranny of Now. <laughs> You want everything now, everything now, everything now. <laughs> then you make all sorts of mistakes because you have everything now. <laughs> you are not waiting for information, etc. that has to come to you. <laughs> that is necessary to make a decision sometimes. So the tyranny of now is another problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so similarly, space, what is the truth of space? Here, here means what? This room? But this room is about 200 square feet. So here, where I am sitting, must be about 4 square feet. So what is the truth? 1 square inch can be further divided. In school mathematics you may have studied. They are trying to teach you the concept of space actually. They are failing miserably. There are infinite points on the number line. <laughs> what does it mean? Finite point. <laughs> a point is a location here. <laughs> so between any two points, you can have further points. No? Because any two points on the number line, there can be infinite. Between one and two. 
1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1.5, go on and on. Between 1 and 1.1, 1.01, 1 .1, 1 .1, what, is, what are you trying to say? Location. You can further, 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 what is the truth? No length is the truth of time. Yeah, no length. Then who is left behind? What is left behind? The observer of the observer of space is left behind. No space is the truth of space. Like no time is the length of time now. Similarly, here means what? No space. <laughs> means only I am there. So I am the truth of both the time and space. Only then I become limitless consciousness. And this limitless consciousness. What's your problem? Any problem you tell me will belong to the role. Any limitation you will talk about will belong to the body and mind, not you. And what is there? No problem, no issues. So, if you are unconditioned by time and space, you are limitless. Therefore, your satyam existence, consciousness, because not limited by time, so existence, consciousness, your true nature, and anantam, meaning limitlessness. This anantam is very often presented as anandam. Why to bring your experience into picture? Because any moment of joy, you don't have any limitation. In that moment. I was walking on the road. Suddenly between two buildings, I saw the moon. Ah, beautiful. Happy. Where did that happiness come? Not from the moon. Because there is another guy looking at the same moon, very unhappy. Why? His honey is not anywhere close by. So there is no honey moon. Honey is far away. <laughs> yeah. So, no issues on that. Not from the moon, it's from you. Mind projecting into a desire. I want that house. I saved and then invested. That I want that house. You got it. What happened? Ananda manifests itself. From the house? Then why did the person who wanted to sell the house not keep it with the person? If that house was happening, the person would never have sold it. But he's selling it now, he's building it to sell it to you. <laughs> that mind was projecting into that desire, arrested. Because you got it. The ananda that you are manifested. The limitlessness, when it manifests in your mind, is called ananda. A general projecting mind. The moon, arrested. You are stuck in a traffic jam. Bombay is quite common. I am sure Bangalore, Calcutta also is quite common. <laughs> Even Delhi, though, I know it is common. You are stuck. And you have resigned yourself to it. And the neighboring car, you see a cute little kid making faces. And a smile goes on you. <laughs> Where does that happiness come? Situation is unhappy. <laughs> Yourself. When your projecting mind is knocked off temporarily, the, an, the limitlessness that you are <coughs> manifests itself and you call yourself Ananda. The Upanishadic statement for the self is Satyam Jnanam Anantam, which in common parlance is very often called as Sachid Ananda. Therefore, the ananda is not to be translated as bliss, joy, etc. Okay? 
they are very subjective words. They don't communicate anything. Like when you say bliss, what is bliss? Aha. Two days back there was a heat wave in Bombay, and I had gone all the way to Kalyan. In the hot sun, came back, and on the way back, we drank some nice cold sugar cane juice. Aha, ha, ha, blissful. <laughs> Is that what you are talking about yourself? <laughs> An experienced sugar cane juice. <laughs> 20 rupees, big deal. <laughs> Another character is diabetic, no, no, I can't take that. He is unhappy there. <laughs> so, what is bliss? Bliss is highly subjective word, it doesn't communicate anything. Isn't it? Isn't bliss a very subjective word? Is there a communication? So I, that's why I never use the word bliss as a translation for Ananda. The closest you can come, if you want to use my word, is a sense of fullness, of fulfillment. You're so full that nothing can take it away or add to it. Now here there is some communication available. The actual word would be limitlessness. You have no limits of time, space, etc. That makes more sense. A statement like that makes more sense. Therefore, be careful. There are many people, books, etc., that use the word bliss. I have a suspicion that they are blissfully ignorant of what it really means. <laughs> Because most translations came during Annie Besant's time. And we are blindly using the same translations. Okay. At that time, the Englishman who wanted to translate did not know Sanskrit. And the Sanskrit scholar did not know English. So in between them, they had to struggle and find some common ground. So all translations are highly limited. Okay. Yeah. They have their own issues. Which will be true when you are translating from any language to any language. If you are translating, you have to translate from Sanskrit idiom to English idiom. And sometimes those idiomatic expressions are not available. You know? Like I read a translation of a very beautiful Tamil work. It's a masterpiece in Tamil called Punni in Selvan. The Tamil people here would know that book. And I read the English translation. So there's a translation. Da 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 da. What a scene spread before his eyes. What is the da 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 da? Someone who's reading English. <laughs> now in Tamil it makes great sense. <laughs> but in English, what nonsense is that? <laughs> it should have been translated into English idiom. He used words like, wow, what a scene spread before his eyes. Something like that would have made sense. <laughs> From <laughs> Tamil idiom to English idiomatic translations are necessary. Not available. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because words like moksha, shreyas, etc. defies translation in English because the concept is not there in English. Yeah. Similarly, I'm sure some English concepts will not be there in. Indian languages, that's okay. That's part of the game. It's not about superiority of a language. It is what is available in the language. Yeah. <laughs> now the question comes. If that all that is there, I should be free. Correct. Well, all of you should be able to say, like Krishna, uh, like Arjuna said, no? Nashto moha smritarlam. Okay, I come. The job is over, done. I'm free. So in the next few verses, Krishna goes about talking what is necessary to really understand this and make it a fact of your life as well. What I have given you all is an insight today. Now this insight is explained over the next 600 and odd verses. 
because about 50, 60 verses are gone by <laughs> 700 verses of the Gita. So this is elaborated and explained. So in the next few verses, he also explains what is necessary in your mind to get this thing. He doesn't elaborate. Why? Because Arjuna had all that. So for Arjuna's sake, it is not necessary. That's why at the end of the Gita, he could say, Nashto Moha Smritarla. I'm fine. That is role. Battle awaits. He could say that. We may need a little bit more explanation of what is necessary to understand and own up Vedanta. Make it a fact of our life. But that we shall see next class. Okay? <laughs> yeah. I have covered a huge topic.